Boa noite a todos. É, hoje nós teremos o prazer é, de poder contar com a presença do professor Isaac Brook. O professor Brook é professor de pediatria é, na Georgetown University, em Washington. E suas áreas de especialização, de maior publicação, essas infecções de cabeça e pescoço, trato respiratório e infecções após irradiação. O Dr. Brook é autor de seis livros didáticos médicos, mais de 150 capítulos em livros médicos e mais de 750 publicações científicas. Ele é editor de quatro revistas médicas e editor associado em outras quatro. O Dr. Brook ele foi diagnosticado com câncer de laringe e submetido à laringectomia total em 2008. Desde então, ele tem tentado ajudar outras pessoas laringectomizadas palestrando e publicando livros a respeito. Ele é autor de livros como Minha Voz, Experiência Pessoal de um Médico com Câncer de Garganta, é, Guia do Laringectomizado e, agora, é, no contexto da pandemia do Covid, ele fez um e-book é, chamado é, Guia do Laringectomizado na Pandemia de Covid-19. É, ambos essas publicações estão disponíveis em português é, gratuitamente como em forma de e-book. Então, inicialmente, em nome da ABLV e também da ABOL, eu gostaria de agradecer a presença do professor Brook é, nessa entrevista. A doutora Adriana Rachê também vai estar presente nessa entrevista que faremos, então, com o professor Brook. Uh, so, Dr. Brook, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Uh, professor Brook, you are in a unique situation of those who experience both points of view in the treatment process as a doctor and as a patient. In this interview, we'll try to address what we doctors do right or wrong when dealing with patients with head and neck cancer. In your opinion, should we doctors uh, try to adopt a paternalistic stance, like suggesting the conduct that you think is best for the patient, or just expose the options uh, that the patient might have according to his diagnosis and a stage of his disease and leave it to the patient to decide? I think that uh, the patient should be part of the process as much as possible. And I think the doctors should provide the patient uh, all the information they need to look at the options and make the best decisions uh, about their life and about their health. They should also try to encourage the patient to read and understand as much as possible. And if they have any doubts, even look for the patient to look for a second opinion so that they can come together to a conclusion what is the best treatment the patient can have. The other important thing doctors should remember is that the patient is in a very a unique state of mind. The patient is usually very much in stress. They have to face life and death decisions. And it's very difficult to deal with it. I know from my experience, I wanted uh, to get the cancer out as soon as possible. Uh, and even though my doctors explained to me uh, again and again what they want to do and what is the reason, I only absorbed a very small amount of what they told me. And so uh, the doctors should encourage the patient to listen, even bring somebody with them so that they can uh, tell them later or coach them later uh, what was told and what will happen. Uh, repeating it again is something that's important for the patient's state of mind and understanding. Perfect, sir. Thank you very much. And Professor, when you are dealing with the chances of the cure, because um, it can be very challenging when you are saying to the patient that he, he's, he has a low chance or he has, he has to 
be uh, uh, he has to go over a laryngectomy. Do you think it's better for for us, doctor, just to be more optimistic, or you think we should we should be um, pessimistic and say all the things that can happen to the patient, or try to cheer um, the patient up and be more op optimistic to um, to what he will face? I personally wanted to know the truth. And um, I didn't want uh, uh, to get a picture which was not realistic. Uh, but, my, but patients are different. Some people uh, find it very difficult to uh, look at the truth when it's very threatening and uh, uncertain. And uh, they usually want to, to hear an optimistic uh, answer. Uh, on the other hand, uh, many people prefer the truth. Uh, I think that the doctor needs to make a judgment. Uh, what he says is that state of mind and psychological strength of the patient uh, and the family. When they tell them what's happening, and what will happen. Perfect. And, and sir, uh, what were the main challenges that you faced uh, personally after your laryngectomy? Uh, the main challenge I had was the, to accept the new reality that I uh, am unable to speak, uh, to swallow well, to express my emotion. It was overwhelming. Uh, uh, physically, it was very difficult uh, to wake up with uh, many, many tubes and catheters completely at the mercy of everybody around me. And uh, later on, when I left the hospital, the challenge was uh, a depression feeling uh, lost and helpless and uh, I fortunately was able to overcome it with the support of family, friends, a social worker and very very dedicated and devoted physician and speech pathologist and uh, what helped me go back to life uh, was that I tried to make the best of a difficult situation. Uh, in my case, I decided to devote my time and energy uh, as much as I can to help other people. Uh, and when I became a laryngectomy, I found that I can help many other people like me in getting a better life and returning to productivity. And that's why I wrote the books that I wrote and lectured and wrote articles and, and opened up a, a website to help people. But everybody is different. And many people, they, they find that they, they have a mission, they have a reason to, to go on. And that includes uh, helping others. Uh, going back to their profession if they are working to help people through their work. They um, go and choose causes such as helping fight smoking and alcoholism and early detection of cancer. So to find a meaning uh, for life is very important. What uh, helped me a lot uh, was that I um, I found out a very supportive people. Um, my physicians were very warm and caring, and I call it uh, the power of a hug, that they provided me with a hug 
reject me and may go on with her life. Professor, I think you have already uh, said that, but uh, we do have a lot of young doctors in the audience that is facing like the first time that they will tell uh, a patient that they have a cancer. It's a very a challenge when you have to tell the, uh, the patient that they have a cancer. You have a, a, the, the biopsy in your hands and then you have to tell. What, what, is there any other thing uh, in, the, in the moment that you are saying to the, to the patient, okay, you have a cancer? What we should say or we should never say for this patient, for this patient in that moment? I think that uh, telling the patient the truth that they have cancer is important and uh, we should try to uh, tell them what the prognosis is, what the chances there are uh, and in this case I would uh, try to look at the positive and the optimistic approach that uh, let's say you caught the cancer early on and you have a very good chance of recovery oh, and uh, you have to do a certain thing to ensure that you are going to get better and uh, that is the follow-up and uh, in preventive measures but on the other hand if the prognosis is not good I think that um, it's up to us to prepare them in a very delicate way to the fact that um, it's not going to be 100% sure that they may survive. It's only fair to let them prepare uh, to the end, for the end of life or prepare to uh, whatever they have ahead of them. And that of course should be done as a team approach with the help of social worker, family, even with the use of medications that can allow them to accept the, the reality, the psychological reality, and to live with a feeling of uncertainty. Because that's one of the most difficult things a patient has to live with fear that the cancer may come back and that's something that uh, we as physicians should do the best to help the patient. Is there anything you should um, you can tell the patients um, that is facing this uh, facing a cancer right now and um, discovering they have a cancer and it has to to uh, get a laryngectomy is there anything you you, you want to add? Uh, it was very difficult for me um, when I was in medical school to see patients with laryngectomy and that was many, many years ago, over 45 years ago. And um, there were not many ways laryngectomy can go back to life. But life, uh, choosing laryngectomy is choosing life because the uh, alternative is not good. Um, and I think life as a laryngectomy can be meaningful and help uh, and it, it, it gives you back your life. Medicine has progressed so much. Uh, there are new ways that people can speak. Uh, they can uh, eat well. There are many new treatments. Even for cancer, we are having new treatment modalities in addition to the traditional ones such as radiation, chemo, and then of course surgery. There are new chemotherapeutic immunological treatments and the prognosis has gotten much better and since being with medicine developed. I would also urge people uh, now during the pandemic of COVID, which is very bad in our Brazil, I, I fortunately heard about it, uh, not to delay uh, taking care of themselves if they have symptoms that they worry about, whether it's a new cancer or recurrent, to go and see your doctors 
so that you will be diagnosed and treated early. And they even prevented some more radical treatment. And that uh, otherwise you would have to, have to do if you delay treatment. Perfect, sir. Uh, I'm glad you touched this point. Uh, actually, this is one of our main concerns right now with this pandemic because uh, we know we are delaying diagnosis and treatment of this important disease. So we are very, very grateful for your interview here, sir. Uh, I'm sure it helped us to think more about uh, our role as health providers dealing with head and neck cancer patients. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Professor, for your time. Thank you. Thank you.